Okay, well, I'm going to share some hard scriptures today. Well, a lot of the Bible is hard. I shouldn't apologize for it, but it's not necessarily what I, I want to share, uh, but it's what I have to share. Um, it's the Word of God, so we're going to share the Word of God. Now, I want to take us back a little bit in history, back to the days of John Wesley. John Wesley was, of course, he was a, a British man. He was uh, of the Church of England, and uh, he was radically uh, born again. Uh, actually, he was raised uh, as a Christian, and he was, you know, to the degree that he understood he was trying to follow Christ, even became a missionary to North America, but he completely failed because he wasn't himself converted. He finally went back to England, and then he was dramatically uh, converted. He had a conversion experience. He already knew the word. He already knew the truth, but it wasn't alive in his heart yet. He understood all the theological concepts. He was even a preacher of the word, but it, there was one day where it all came alive. He says, my heart was strangely warmed, and I felt that I did have an interest in Christ. In other words, I did feel like my my sins were forgiven for the sake of Christ. He had a real conversion experience. He had a real assurance of his salvation. After that, if you study the life of Wesley, you'll find that there was a night where they were in all-night prayer, 40 or 50 uh, preachers, uh, the Methodist preachers, and, and the Spirit of God came down upon them in sudden power that night, just baptized them all in, in the Holy Spirit in power. They fell to the floor. They were shocked and awe, and they just rose up praising God. And you can see the supernatural finger of God on Wesley's life uh, throughout all of his years, and not just on him, but on many of the Methodist preachers. They, they worked in, 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 clear, in, a, in, a, in a clear demonstration of the spirit and, in, and of power. It wasn't just the words of intellect that they used. There was much more to it than that. There was a supernatural presence. There was a supernatural convicting power that was at work when they preached. And, and so there was one famous uh, um, British uh, English intellectual that was over in America, and he made a comment. He said, of all the preaching I hear today, I don't find anybody. He was not a Methodist. He was not of that movement because the Methodists were kind of the low class. They were not the high church, the very pompous Church of England where they're very formal and very official and have these elaborate buildings. And the Methodists were poor. They were, you know, very simple clothing, but they had power in their ministry and in their preaching. Um, this man was not one of them, but he would go to, it came to America, North America. At the time, it was the colonies. It was not yet the United States. And, and he went around listening to all the preachers, and he said, I have not found anyone who can teach me here in America. No one that can teach me except these Methodists. And he gave an illustration. He said, they preach with power. Their words are alive. Everything else is just like putting the people to sleep. There was really something about this movement that, uh, that brought a, an awakening. It's called the First Great Awakening, which brought thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the knowledge of God. Now, remember, these are so-called Christian nations, but they didn't know God. You, you can be in a Christian nation and not know God. You can be just as lost. Just go to Indonesia. Go to Manado. Uh, go to Entete. You'll find even though these are Christian areas, they're just as lost as in as in Banten, just as lost as in Java, just as lost as in Sumatra. Go to the Batak areas. They're just as lost there, by and large, as they are in Aceh. It doesn't, it's, you know, you can be in a Christian area. You can be from a, a Christian family, but be completely lost. Be drunkards and, and womanizers and, and smokers and thieves and liars and, and just living a worldly life, living for pleasure and not God. And so, so John Wesley, God used him, and he brought such a movement. In fact, there was a book that was written called England Before and After John Wesley. Can you imagine a book being written about your life that said, Indonesia, before and after Gabby Chang? I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> that, can you imagine that your life was, that becomes the object that somebody writes a book about, and not just about you and your life and how interesting it was and no but the fact that the entire nation you're from was changed as a result of your life the entire nation not just the nation of england but the colonies as well that's north america radically dramatically completely changed 
by the power of this life. How is that possible? You say, how is it possible? I tell you how it's possible because John Wesley would preach sermons sometimes two or three hours long and sometimes he would just preach nothing but the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. In fact, it's reliably reported that in some of these meetings where he would preach for hours, hours, two, three hours straight, no breaks, no bathroom breaks, ladies, preaching the word of God, that at the end of the time, there would be up to a thousand people. You say, a thousand people listening? No, this guy had crowds of tens of thousands of people listening sometimes. A thousand people laying flat on the ground, completely unconscious. Did you hear that? Laying on the ground, completely unconscious. What happened? They were seized with the reality of the holiness of God and their own utter vileness, sinfulness before such a holy God. How can I stand? And they realize I cannot stand before him. The problem with our generation is this. People think that we are good people with a bad God. They, they read about God in the Bible. Man, God was mean. God was evil. God was bad. No. They think we are good people with a bad God, and they don't realize it's the exact opposite. We're a wicked and evil people with a completely pure and holy, perfect God. And people don't understand that. They don't understand that they're wicked. They don't understand how impure they are because they, they don't know who God is. They don't know the glory. They don't know the majesty. They don't know the purity. They don't know the enormity of God, the immensity of God. They don't know the eternity of God. They don't know how vast he is. They don't know how great he is. They don't know how powerful he is. They don't know how pure he is. Therefore, they go on in their sin thinking as if nothing. They think of God as like a Santa Claus in the sky. He's like my Lao, Lao Tianye in Chinese. Just an old man up in the sky, I guess, right? Just the old man. He doesn't know nothing. He doesn't know. You have no idea who God is. That is not God. That is a lie. That does not exist. There is no one like that. When you watch like uh, Shi Ji, you watch the Chinese uh, ideas of the, the heavenly court or whatever, it's just a bunch of dumb old men up there. It's just a bunch of fools. You got Sun Wukong, a monkey, goes up there and beats them all. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's their concept of heaven, you know? That's ridiculous when you watch, like, Chinese, uh, you, know, uh, you know, their novels and their, their stories or whatever, and it's like, that's how they, that's their reverence towards heaven? Yeah, it's not really any reverence because, you know, even like the Xunjiang, Xunjiang, uh, the, 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 the monk, uh, the Heshang in uh, Shi Ji, in the Journey to the West, he's an idiot. He's a fool. And this is the so-called holy man. Look at these guys. They're just fools and looking at heaven. They're a bunch of old fuddy-duddies. They don't know what they're doing up there. Sun Wukong, a magical monkey, goes up there and whoops them all. <laughs> you know what? It's terrible when you think about it like that, when you think, of the, oh, that's the Chinese idea of God and heaven and all that. And you know what's much worse than that? When Christians think something similar about the true God. God have mercy. When you, that's why I completely reject. Remember that thing called Veggie Tales, the little children's story? That stuff's evil. Evil. You say, evil? How, it's a funny cartoon. No, it's not. They make serious stories about a holy God, a joke. That does not glorify God. When I was younger, I, you know, when I was, I liked it. I thought it was funny. Now, I, when I got, when I, when I understood more of the truth, I realized that's not funny. That's wicked. That's why you have to be very careful in children's church how we teach the children. It can't just be a bunch of funny stories about Noah and his ark, and it's just a big funny story. No, that's a terrifying nightmare. Noah's ark is a terrifying nightmare of the wrath of God on wicked people. Do you realize that? Jonah and the whale, a rebellious man who should perish, but only that God had mercy on him. You understand? These are not little fairy tales for children. These are horror stories for adults. But we've got it all turned upside down when we think of heaven as a, as a joke. When we think of God, as like, oh, he doesn't really know what's going on up there. He doesn't, oh, man, we are lost when we think like that.
So what did John Wesley have? He just had the Bible, the same Bible that you and I have. Exact same Bible, exact same book. In fact, he used the King James Bible, which we have today. I use this as the new King James. It's just an update. Same translation, same stories, same book. You say, well, it was a different generation back then. They were kind of more old-fashioned. Listen, the human heart has been utterly wicked. The first man born of woman was a what? A what? A murderer. Do you understand that? The first man. We're not talking like, well, in the last generation, people got very wicked. We're talking thousands, probably 6,000 years ago, however long it was. Six, seven, who knows how many thousand years ago it was. Adam and Eve had a son, and he murdered his brother. Do you understand that? Human nature did not recently become a certain way, and it did not improve. It did not improve. Do you know under, I think it's under, I don't even know the figure, under communism in the last century, how many millions and millions and millions of innocent lives were completely destroyed, murdered? Not just in China, Cambodia, other places, just completely murdered. Human nature has not gotten better. There's no question about that. So what in the world did John Wesley have? He had a great way of speaking, right? Nobody can speak that well that a thousand people lie on the ground unconscious. He simply had this word, the word of truth, the word of truth about God, about mankind, about Jesus Christ, the message of the Old Testament, the message of the New Testament, the message from the law, the message from the prophets, the message from the gospels, the message from the epistles, from the book of Revelation, simply had these truths preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just simple True words with the sovereign spirit of the Lord opening the eyes and the ears of the hearers. It was not some different doctrine. You can read his sermons today. I have books of Wesley sermons. They're good sermons. They're great sermons. But they don't have that power except that God supernaturally fills those words and moves upon them. He had the word of truth and the power of the Spirit illuminating the word so that people listen to this, not just so they understood it. That's our problem. We feel we stop at understanding it. No, no, no. It's not enough to just understand the word. Some of you have understood, understood more of the Bible than half the pastors in Jakarta, but you don't feel the word. It's not enough to understand it. You need to feel it. It's not enough to understand it. You need to feel it in the very depths of your soul. The reason people don't repent, they hear the message, they understand it. One of the main reasons they don't repent, they stay as they are, is because they've heard it, but they haven't felt it. They still keep it at arm's length. In other words, they feel like that's true, but it doesn't have a direct application to me to my life. That's for other people. And that's the great error. It's for others, but not me. That was a good message, Pastor. You were preaching straight to my wife today. Oh, my husband really needed to hear that. Be careful. Isaiah 33, verse 14. (laughs) 
The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Do you know who that's talking about? Do you know what that's talking about? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? Why with reverence and godly fear? For our God is a consuming fire. Go back a few verses into verse 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest. He's talking about Mount Sinai. He's writing to the Hebrews. You guys are not at Mount Sinai. And he describes a terrifying scene, verse 19. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. That's true. That's exactly what happened. They heard it and they were terrified, shaken. They, they could not take it, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. He said, you guys have not come there. Where have you come to? You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. You've come to a mountain that's far holier than that of Mount Sinai. God came down on Sinai and shook it, but here you've come up to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, Isaiah 33, 14 is a very important verse. It asks a very important question, and it's a question that I'm going to ask us today. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? Do you know who that's talking about, right? It's talking about God, that God is is a consuming fire. And it's very difficult for man to dwell with him. How long did Adam and Eve last in the garden? Nobody knows, but they didn't have children yet. They didn't even have sin yet. but they didn't make it long. Without sin, they didn't make it long before they sinned and were thrown out. How long did Satan and his angels make it in heaven before they were cast out? We don't know. But there's a Bible verse that talks about in Job that, that even the angels are impure in his sight. Now, this is not talking about fallen angels. That's talking about unfallen angels. But they're, they don't have sin, right? That's right, they don't have sin. But even they are considered, in a sense, impure in his sight. Why? Because nothing can be compared with the uncreated God. You, the uncreated God could make a perfectly white stone, without blemish, perfect in every way, shining. When you put that perfectly white, shining stone next to him, it's as black as the, the, the night sky. 
Do you understand that? Nothing can be, so that if you put an angel, a perfect angel, not a fallen angel, next to him, the angel covers its face and its feet. Do you understand? They cannot draw near to this God. They cannot even look upon him. They're angels. They know no sin. Yet they must cover themselves in humility and fear of his absolute. Now, if this is an angel with no sin, how about you and me? An angel with no sin falls on its face before God Almighty in worship, covers itself, in a sense, out of shame, even though it has no sin, no disobedience. We have no idea how pure God is. We have no idea how holy God is. We have no idea how bright the light that God dwells in really is. All we know is this. The Bible says, if any man will see him, he will die. No one can see the Lord and survive. Even in the Old Testament, when they did see God in a sense, it was never direct vision. It was never direct vision. Remember when Moses cried out to see his glory? What did God do? He had to take him and put him like in a little rocky shelter, and God passed by and let him see him from behind. Well, I, what does that mean? I don't really know. We don't really know. But all we know is it means this. God did not allow him to see his full glory. He could not see it and live. Do you understand? God had to cover him in this cleft of the rock, cover him, shelter him from himself. In other words, God is showing him himself, but the same God has to cover him and protect him from himself because himself he will destroy Moses. He will destroy him by his holiness, not his wrath, not his judgment. His holiness alone will kill him, annihilate him, destroy him. It's the same thing in Ezekiel's vision. He sees God on the throne, but he never describes God on the throne. He never gets that far. You just, oh, there's a form, but it's no detail there. He, he describes the base of the throne, the cherubim underneath it, and, and the crystal glass sea sort of thing. And then, but, but then he just says, and there was someone on the throne, but it stops right there. It can't get beyond that. Isaiah in the temple, what did he see? I, in Isaiah 6, he saw the robe of his, t the train of his... Uh, his robe filling the temple. And you know there's one sitting on the throne, but that's as far as it goes. I don't know which version of God that you have, but if it's not this one I'm describing right now, then it's false. There's only one true God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he didn't all of a sudden magically stop being eternal, almighty, absolutely holy. He never stopped being what he always has been, and he never will. And we have to ask the question, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Who can stand before him? I want you to ask yourself that question. How shall I stand before him? How can I stand before him. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're going to go through some verses here. I'm going to shed some light on this. 1 Samuel. We're going to start in uh, chapter 2. But we understand that in verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Now remember, they're priests. They're priests, they're priests, they're corrupt, and they don't know the Lord. You have to understand, the fact of somebody standing behind a pulpit does not mean 
that they know the Lord, and it does not mean that they're, they're good necessarily. There's wolves in sheep's clothing. How do you know the difference? Well, one way is from the message they preach. A wolf preaches a false message about God. He makes God seem very light, very easy, very simple, very harmless. That's a lie. That's a complete lie. A God such as that would never send his beloved son to die a miserable death on the cross. It must be, what sort of a God must it be that would allow his only beloved perfect son to die a miserable, brutal death on a cross? It must be a God who is absolutely holy, absolutely righteous. I mean, just indescribable. But it would simply not be a Santa Claus in the sky. It's just some sort of a, you know, Lao Kenye type, just, just kind of up there, just doesn't really know what he's doing. Just kind of, well, I'm just like your grandfather. I'm just happy and kind, and I, I, I just give you candies all the time and stuff like that. That's nonsense. It's not true at all. That is not the God that rules the heavens and the earth. But so the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priests, and the priests' custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat for you, but raw. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would, say, he would then answer him, no, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord, or they despised the sacrifice of the Lord. They mistreated, they abused the offerings of God's people. Now look in verse 22. Now Eli, so Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel. Now look at this, it gets even worse. And how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle. They're wicked adulterers as well. They're married men living in a wickedly sinful, greedy, sexually immoral life. So he said to them, why do you do such things? This is Eli rebuking his sons. For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. When someone no longer will hear a voice of correction or rebuke, beware. When someone will no longer allow themselves to be disciplined, we call it discipleship, corrected, led, rebuked, that's not a good sign. It doesn't mean that you're mature and that you know better. It possibly means that God has given you over to your stubborn and rebellious heart. And if that's the case, as it says here, the Lord desired to kill them. So how, how does the Lord, what, is, what does it mean that the Lord desires to kill them? Well, he's not going to take away their sins. And he took away all conviction in any even sense that they were wrong. And we'll see later how these guys were, they did not feel they were wrong. They boldly took the ark out into battle as if they were on God's side. And they had no idea they were the very object of God's wrath. God have mercy on us if we will no longer receive loving, truthful, Correction, rebuke. Hear me. Some of you maybe need to hear this. Beware when you get tired, yin fan, fed up with hearing a word 
of correction or rebuke. That's for your own good, for your own soul. So this is the judgment against the sons. Look in verse 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? But he just rebuked them. It wasn't enough to just rebuke them. God did not accept that. God did not accept it. So you have to understand that just verbally saying something sometimes is not enough. Hear me, parents, when you're trying to correct your children, you just kind of scold them? No. There's a time and a place where you must take action. And if you don't, remember Eli and his sons. This is amazing. Verse 29 again. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me? To make yourselves fat, with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place despite all the good which God does for Israel and, and, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons on Hophni and Phinehas and one day they shall die, both of them. Judgment is coming on the priesthood in Israel. Turn to Chapter 4, this is when the battle breaks out. The Philistines come against them. Verse, chapter 4, verse, um, starting in verse 1. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. That's not supposed to happen. They're not supposed to die against the Philistines. They, God gave all the promises through Joshua that they would conquer. So how is it that they're dying on the battlefield? They should be able to annihilate them by the power of God. They should not be dying in battle. Should not be. This should not be. This is not supposed to be. Verse 3 and when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? That's the right question. That is the right question. They're asking the right question. Why has God allowed us to be defeated? That's not supposed to be what happens. They're supposed to conquer the enemies. They're supposed to destroy the Philistines and drive them out of the land completely. They're supposed to be the head and not the tail. But here they are dying at the hands of these pagans. And they ask this question. It's the right question. But notice what happens next. They get the wrong answer. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to, to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. Oh, Lord. Oh, the superstition of people, even the people of God. So superstitious living in sin, and yet thinking this ark will protect us. How many Christians live in sin, and then they say, Pastor, just pray for me so that everything will be okay. Are you kidding? 
Noah himself could come and pray for you. Daniel the prophet could come and pray for you. Job could come and stand before God, and God won't hear their prayers. Why? If you're living in sin, if you're walking in disobedience, if you're walking in rebellion and darkness, there's nothing that's going to cover your sin. Our God is a consuming fire. He's, you cannot appease him with superstitious activities. I don't mean that prayer is superstitious, no. But it is when you substitute it for holiness and obedience to God. The Bible commands everywhere good works. You will not be saved without good works. I'm sorry. There is faith without works is dead. But when you trust in works to be your means of salvation and you use that as a substitute to cover your greater need, it's nothing more than, than, than superstition and idolatry, thinking that somehow you could buy the mercy of God by paying a certain price. You cannot buy it. It's not for sale. It's like Simon the sorcerer trying to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter's reaction was basically to hell with you and your money. He called down curses over him. How dare you even suggest that the grace of God, that the gift of God could be paid for with money. How dare we think that we can cover the wrath of God with our own fig leaves of self-righteousness? Never, never, never. He's a consuming fire. You cannot purchase the mercy of God with anything that you do. Never, 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 never. It's the height of idolatry. It's the height of belittling God. It's despising God. When you think that you could do something on your own to appease his wrath, Dare you think such a thing? Never, ever, ever in a million years. There's nothing you can do to cover your sins. Nothing you can do to take away his wrath. Nothing you can do to appease his justice against you. Nothing. You're completely naked before a holy judge. And there's nothing you can do to appease his wrath. Nothing you can do to take away his judgment. Absolutely nothing. And it is the height of wickedness to even think that you could. It's utterly despising God. You say, I will offer my firstborn son. And you think you're offering God something great. And God is there in heaven thinking, what utter reproach to my name. Number one, that he thinks I will take the murder of his son in place of his sins. So he's going to add sin to sin. And number two, that he thinks that such a little price could be enough to cover his great transgressions against me. Utterly wicked. Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Right question. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Response. So the people sent to Shiloh that they, may, they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts who dwells between the cherubim. They recognize this is the very house of God, that God actually dwells there above this Ark of the Covenant. And yet feet away, they're fornicating, stealing, Eli's compromising. Israel's going astray, worshiping idols with the very presence of the living God in their very midst. Well, what do you think's going to happen? Verse 5, And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. You know what? It's as if the Philistines understood better than 
the Hebrews themselves. They were terrified that God would be in their midst. But Hophni and Phinehas, they were not terrified that God was there, and God was there, but they didn't feel him. They didn't perceive him. They didn't recognize him until it was too late, until their heads were cut off in battle, until the wrath of God was finally appeased on their flesh and cut them down. Then they realized who they had despised. Then they realized they never got away with it. They never got away with it. Nobody ever gets away with it. Nobody gets away with sin, only temporarily. But everybody ultimately faces the full consequences of their deeds. So skip down to verse 16. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, what happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. How can it be? With the Ark of the Covenant there, because God is not a superstitious God. Do you understand that? He will never accept ceremonies or rituals or offerings or sacrifices in place of obedience. I desire obedience more than sacrifice. So the messenger answered and said, Israel fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter, a great slaughter. Not only did God not protect them, they were slaughtered. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God, where God dwells, where God made his throne, in a sense, in Israel, has been captured. You must understand this. If you if, and I will not honor God, fear God, and worship and serve our God, who is a consuming fire, he will leave us. His presence will go Always. Uh, the Bible says he will never leave me and never forsake me. Read the context. It's for those that go and obey the Great Commission, for obedient disciples, not for rebellious Jonas that run away from God. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy for he had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law Phinehas' wife was with child due to be delivered and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead she bowed herself and gave birth for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark of God had been captured because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. And when a people live in sin, when a priesthood is compromised and corrupted, and a people walk about ignorant of God and his ways, God's glory will depart and they will fall into judgment. Now, this is the people of God attempting to dwell together with God. Or the priesthood is particularly in focus here. Eli and his sons are now dead. Their extended family, dead. Thousands of Israelites slaughtered on the battlefield. Is it because God is not good? Is it because God is not kind? 
Is it because God is not merciful? Absolutely not. It's because people, these people, were wicked. It's because God is so good. And they are defaming, dishonoring, blaspheming his name. They are abusing the worship of God, abusing the temple or the, the, sh- the tabernacle of God, abusing the, the offerings of God's people. They're abusing the entire system. They've made the worship of the living God into something that more um, resembles the worship of idols. Therefore, God stepped down and cut them off. and removed his presence from his people. And then in chapter 5, we can see that the Israelites didn't get along very well with God. Let's see how the Philistines do with God in their midst. Verse 2, chapter 5, when the Philistines took the ark of God They brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. That's their God and their temple. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. That should have been a sign. But like you and I, (laughs) they were slow to understand that God was the one resisting them. You understand that? God was resisting them. They didn't know it. They didn't perceive it. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Second sign. This one more drastic than the first. Much stronger than the first. Much more revealing. Is it just a coincidence now that we put our God next to the God of Israel and now he's destroyed on his face before the Ark of the Covenant? Is it just a coincidence? How slow are people to hear, to heed the warnings of God? How slow are people to repent? How slow are people to understand that God is rebuking them, that God is correcting them, that God is trying to save them from destruction? Think of Balaam on his way to go and to curse the people of God. His uh, his, uh, donkey there, did everything it could to stop him finally crushing his leg against the wall and then sitting down under him, not moving, all to save his life. But he beat that thing. He wanted to kill it. He was so angry, you're stopping me in my tracks. Yes, because certain death is right before you and you don't see it. You're blind. You have no ears to hear, no eyes to see that God is the one restraining you. God is the one trying to hold you back, but you insist to press forward. How far must it go? How far will you go? How far? How hard must our hearts be? How hard and stubborn? And then in verse 6, This is how hard, this is how stubborn. It took this, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. Finally, they get the message, but it's a little bit too late. Like Eli and Phinehas and Hophni and Phinehas, while they're, when they're, when they saw the arrow coming at them, the sword about to strike them down to a miserable death on the battlefield, at that moment they realized, God saw all my fornication. God saw all my thievery. God saw all my blasphemy. God saw all my wickedness in the temple. Too late. Cut down. 
Here they are. They, 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 they didn't know the God of Israel. They just knew he's mighty. They didn't know he's the almighty God, but they put him next to their God, and the next day he's on his face. Oh, it was maybe just a coincidence. The next day he's destroyed. That cannot be a coincidence. Something's happening here. And here's death striking them now. The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, This is just like you and me. This is just like us. They said, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. A compromise measure, a temporary measure, an easy fix. That's not the answer. Just move it away from here. It'll be better. Oh, just, just, let's just back off for a while. Let's just pull away. Let's just do our own thing. Let's just kind of remove ourselves from the pressure, remove ourselves from the circumstance. Let's just kind of back off. Let's, oh, God, have mercy. That is not the solution. It's the hand of God pursuing you. And you're just going to move the ark to another city. But that's exactly how we are. Because it's easier in the short run than paying the humiliating price of returning it to the people we stole it from. Much easier. Just move it to Gath. Much easier. We save face. And we protect ourselves. Just distance ourselves a little bit. And God is saying, no, you humble yourselves. You give it back. You return it. They don't want to do that. So what's the result? More destruction. Verse 9. So it was after they had carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Something was happening. I've looked this up in the, the Greek Septuagint and just different translations to kind of get an idea of what was happening here. The way it's in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is very funny. It talks about their seat, their behinds, okay? Some, their behinds were rotting or something. Something like they get a tumor in their behind area and rot. It's just, just nasty. Some sort of tumors and rottenness. It was just absolutely, the word hemorrhoid is not strong enough. It's much worse than that. They tried again. Well, let's send it to Ekron. But the Ekronites cried out, saying, they've brought the ark of, our, of the God of Israel to, to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place. So that, it, so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Listen, if they would have dealt quickly with this issue, they would have spared many lives. But because they did not deal with it properly and correctly and immediately, but they looked for short-term measures, push it over there, push it over there. Just get it out of our sight. Just put it, let somebody else deal with it. They brought destruction throughout their own land. What's the ultimate problem here? They do not properly recognize or fear the Holy Spirit. God of Israel. We see that from the very beginning, don't we? When they put their, that ark next to their idol, they felt their God was superior. And God would have none of that. God's holiness literally consumed them. So finally, in chapter 6, now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, what shall we do with the ark? Tell us how we should send it to its place. So they said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty. 
In other words, admit you were wrong. That's what it is. Admit you were wrong. Humble yourselves before this great God. Humble yourselves before his people. Do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Wow. A trespass offering. Admit your sin. Admit you despise the holy God of Israel. You offended him and his people. Then you will be healed. And it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. And they sent it back. I'm going to skip over some of this. They hitched it to a cart and sent it on the road back to Israel. And the wrath of God departed from them. The holy God of Israel, they could not dwell with him. Eli, Hophni, Phinehas, they could not dwell with him. Philistines found out they could not dwell with him. Send him back, back to Israel. They send him back. This is where he was supposed to go, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Then the men did, so they took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they set the ark of the Lord on the cart and the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh, Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And the Lord to the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Interesting, they locked up their, uh, their, their cows, shut up their, cow, their calves in a pen, and sent the cows on the road. Normally, their natural tendency would be to go back to their calves, but they didn't. They went straight up the road to Beth Shemesh, to Israel, because God was sending them against their own will, they didn't want to go. The cows didn't want to go. That's why they were lowing the whole way. Moo, moo, moo. I want to go back to my baby. But no, you take this ark to Israel and you go and be sacrificed there as a burnt offering. That's my will for your life. Sometimes God's plan for us is not what we want, but it's what he determines. Sometimes God's will for us is not according to our natural desire. Everybody always thinks, oh, well, just, it's what I want to do. It must be God's will. That is not true. Which Bible are you reading? Often in the word of God, the will of God is directly opposite what your flesh and what your heart so desires. Think of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will. What his flesh desired was completely different from what God had determined for him, but he was willing to accept it anyway. So they sent it back, and then in verse 13, now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field. They were rejoicing. They were happy. Our ark is the ark of the covenant. These are the people of God. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there, so they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. This is a very religious people. They're very zealous for God. What a blessed, holy people. Now they're, they're doing these religious offerings. Now they must be mightily blessed of God. Verse 15, the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it in which were the articles of gold and put them on the large stone. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. Holy people, blessed people. My, oh man, this is awesome. Skip down to verse 19. How mightily blessed they must be because they're so zealous to serve God. And now the ark is there with them. Verse 19. Then he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck 50,070 men of the people. And the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Verse 20. And the men of Beth Shemesh, these are the ones that had just been sacrificing to God. These are the ones that had just been rejoicing that the ark has returned. Now they're struck 50,070 men. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? Listen. If they could not, 
then how shall you? If they could not stand before this holy God, if Moses had to be hidden in a cleft in the rock and God's hand had to cover him so he wouldn't die when the Lord passed by, how will you stand before him? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Eli didn't do so well, did he? Hophni and Phinehas didn't do so well, did he? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? The people of Israel didn't do so well, did they? The Philistines were destroyed. The people of Beth Shemesh, 50-something thousand cut down in one instant. Hebrews 4.11 says something that's probably one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Probably a lot of times I misquoted it myself. But anyway, Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Okay, so it's an exhortation to faith and obedience to God. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Listen, I want you to understand. This is talking about judgment. The word of God being living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, it's talking about God's judgment for disobedience, for rebellion. And there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Do you understand that? That's how we stand before God. No place to hide. The word of God, the God, it, it penetrates to the reality of who we really are, what we really are, what we really think. The scrutiny of God is perfect. He knows exactly what it is. He knows exactly where it is. And he is exactly righteous to deal with it according to his righteousness, his justice, his retribution. People don't understand who God is, so they don't fear him. If you know who he is, you will fear him. You you will fear him. And you will be afraid. Because you will recognize, as it says here, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That means I have no secrets from God. That means that God sees right through me. God knows everything about me. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Well, That's the foundation to bring the next part, which is this, that you will stand before God and give an account for everything. That is bad news. That is terrifying 
news, but it's an inescapable reality. The question is, how will you stand? When you know something of who God is, how he deals with sin. If you know something of how good he is and of how bad you are, as in the days of John Wesley, it's so powerful that it could make you go unconscious in fear and shock and terror. I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again because it fits. But the time where a friend and I were overwhelmed with the reality that we had become Pharisees. We were very zealous for God and for the Bible, etc., but our hearts were not right, and we had become complete spiritual Pharisees. And God let us go on that path for a year or two before he even showed us at all. And one night, we were sitting in, in his car together talking, and he was, in the drive, he was driving, and the car was running. We were parked. And the more we talked, it's like, you know how an onion has layer after layer after layer? The more we talked about what we were dealing with, what God was showing us, it's like the more real it became to us. It was like ever-increasing realization of the fear of God and how wicked we really were. And it came to a point where he became so overwhelmed and terrified, he literally fainted. His eyes rolled back, and he fainted right before me. And his last words are something like, read the Bible to me, read Psalms to me. He fainted right there. Because he had no, he saw how wicked he was. And he knew how perfect and holy God is. And he had no answer for it. No answer. The problem with most people is they have a solution before they even have a problem. They've been given the antidote before they've ever been diagnosed with the disease. And how many know, how many know, how many know that a cure to cancer doesn't mean much to you when you don't have cancer? There is a disease. And there is an end to it. Just as cancer leads to death, a taking away of life, a cutting short of life, a destruction, misery, and pain, so does sin lead to death and utter misery and eternal hell. And there must be an answer for this. Okay, I'm going to shift gears. And just say this. Everything I've said up till now is the foundation the background, the only foundation of background, to understand how glorious the gospel is. What good news the gospel is. It's what makes the gospel so amazing that the very same God that we've been speaking about all morning now who is utterly righteous, holy, searching, punishing, judging, with wrath, with righteousness, with zeal, is the very same God. The very one that we shake and tremble before is the very same one that, in a sense, just like Moses, who wanted to see God but had to be protected from God by God. The very same God that we tremble before and we shake before, and Moses was 
fear, you know, fearful and trembling before him is the very same one that reaches out to us in mercy and gives us a true covering for sins. The only covering in the entire universe. There's no other covering. Now, many people have many solutions to this problem. Like Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they immediately tried to find a solution. They used fig leaves and they ran away. And this is what most people do. They just have different versions of leaves. Some use oak leaves, some leaves, palm leaves, many types of leaves, but it's, at the end of the day, it's nothing but leaves, and everybody tries to go away from the, from the true God. But at the end of the day, God's going to search, and God's going to find, and God's gonna have, they're going to have to meet God face to face. And the fig leaves and the running will not meet the need. It will not cover their shame, will not cover them. Only God has a way. And symbolically in the garden, the Bible says God clothed their nakedness with skins. So the animals shed their blood to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. This is symbolic of the fact that God himself would cover them from himself. This is the only way salvation works, friends. There's no other possible way. There's no other way. This is the only way it works, that God himself provides a solution to the problem that he himself creates by his perfection, his holiness. God himself is the one that we're afraid of, not hell. God is the one we're terrified of. It's not hell. It's not the devil. It's God. Hell is just a creation of God. God is the one to be feared, not hell, not even the devil. It's God. In the book of Revelation, when they run, they say, let the rocks cover us. They run into caves they, from the face of the lamb, not from hell, not from the lake of fire. They're terrified of God in his holiness, in his purity, in his power. And the only covering from God is the one that God himself gives. And the covering that he gives is his only begotten son. But notice this. It must be applied. If God sacrificed the animals, put them on Adam and Eve, and they took them off and threw them away, they're not covered. The provision must be appropriated. Make sure of this that the blood is applied to you today. There's no other hope. There's no other answer. Time will not make this problem go away. Good works will not make your problem go away. Good feelings will not make your problem go away. Lots of prayers will not make your, may your problem go away. Only the blood. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For, he, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Listen, without Christ, you and I are all damned forever and ever and ever. But a theoretical Christ will be of no good to you on the day of judgment. He must be an actual Christ. He must be in your life. He must be in your heart. His blood must be upon your head, covering you like the blood of the, the, the lamb in the book of Exodus. It had to be sprinkled on the top and the bottom of the doorposts. 
If the blood was not found there, even if they killed the animal, the provision was, was made, but it was not applied, then the angel of death would go through and destroy the firstborn in that house. There is a way for free mercy, clothing, forgiveness, but it must be applied. Verse 11 again. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, that means sins, to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Listen, there's no other way of forgiveness. There's no other way that we could be clothed, covered. Verse 23 Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Friends, don't be satisfied that God made provision until you know that that provision is applied to your soul, to your life. And you have to understand, this is not a past tense thing. Of course, there's a beginning, there's an initiation to it. But if the blood was applied to you so many years ago or months ago or however may be the case, that's not enough. Once is not enough. You must walk in the light as he is in the light that the blood of Jesus may cleanse us from all sin. That's the Bible teaching, friends. So many people think, well, I was saved back then. Who cares if you're not saved today? What good does it do you if you were, not, if you were saved back then? It's not enough that I was saved in the past. Make your calling and election sure today. Let's pray. Father, I pray you yourself will... Teach us these eternal truths, Lord. I pray that you yourself, Lord, will convince us and convict us, uh, for some of us, of the peril and the danger that we're in. Lord, I pray for your overwhelming reality of, of holiness, the overwhelming reality of your purity and your light and your goodness and our badness and wickedness. And I pray, Lord God, that you will bring that stark contrast between your goodness and our wickedness. And I pray, Lord, there would be a deep convicting of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, even for us that have already been converted. And I pray, Lord God, that you will bring forth a desperation in us that we will recognize and acknowledge, I must have this precious blood cover my sins 
not in the past only, but now, today, this very hour, I pray you will bring us once again to humility, to confession, to repentance, Lord God, and to faith and rest in your blood. Not a past rest, a present rest. That's why the writer of the Hebrews says, strive to enter the rest. It's meant to be a present rest. The past, entering in in the past is not enough. Enter in today. For today, if you have ears to hear, do not harden your hearts, but hear his voice today. Hear his voice. Enter in. There is provision. There is grace. For all that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, I pray, Lord, let your spirit, let no one escape your all-searching eye today, your all-convicting Holy Spirit, and your glorious and full provision of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself, his own blood, his own life paid for our sinfulness, Lord. Nothing else could ever pay for our sins against you. I pray you will bring each one of us into a perfect peace today and perfect rest in your sacrifice and your provision and your blood. That our bodies will be washed with pure water. That our consciences will be sprinkled with your blood. And that we will be able to boldly come before the throne of grace today to worship our holy God, to worship you, Lord God. And just as the writer of the Hebrews says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to stir, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day coming. And I just want to say, I believe, I believe by the Holy Spirit that someone here, that God has given you the answer. You've been searching, you've been struggling, you have not known what to do. You've not known how to resolve the issue, the situation that you're facing right now. And I, and I believe that God is saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. This is the way. I'm giving you an out. I'm giving you a way out right now. I'm giving you a way. I'm preparing a path for your feet. This is the door. Don't delay. Step through it. Walk in. You, you, whatever your struggle has been, but this is it. God is pointing you clearly. This is what, I've, this is what I, he's prepared for you. This is the answer. This is your grace. This is your day of grace. This is your day of melting. This is your day of, of humbling yourself. This is your day of receiving the grace of God. This is your day of, of, of being softened, of being broken, not by the wrath of God's almighty hand, but by the mercy of the blood of his cross. Lord, I pray pray. I pray for the individual, Lord God, who you are speaking to specifically today, Lord God, and you are saying, this is the way out. I'm showing you the way forward. This is the way, my friend. This is the way. I pray, Lord God, that they will hear it with spiritual ears, and they will see it with the spiritual eyes, and they will say, thank you, Lord God. I did. I really did not know how to go forward. I was stuck, and you showed me an answer. And listen, I'm telling you again, this is your answer. God is, he's given you a way forward right now. He's given you a way out. This is your way out. Don't miss it. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait for another, this is your way out. He's given you a way out. He's brought provision. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. Pour out that grace to be healed, to be delivered to be saved. And uh, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Hear that with your heart, my friend. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. 
For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. The balm of healing, the oil of healing is available for you today, my friend. God will heal you. God will work in you. God will set you free. Just receive it. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not children, not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For indeed, they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Father, I just pray, let each one of us hear your word today. Let us hear its medicine to our souls, Lord God. Let us receive your word, Lord God. Let let it be medicine to our souls. And let us take the medicine and let us swallow it down. And let us take it fully. Even if it's a bitter pill, let us swallow it down. Because we know the result is life. The result is life. The result is life. Let us flee the wrath to come today, Lord. And let us know both the kindness and the severity of God. Hallelujah. I pray, Father God, we will truly know your severity and we will truly know your kindness because both are absolutely true and real. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.